Hello, 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 and welcome to Top Surgery Diary Part 2. This is going to be soft-spoken, maybe with a little whispering, whispering. But content warning before I get into this, I am going to be talking about blood a little bit and also about poop-related things. Yes, poop is funny. You're allowed to laugh. <laughs> um, I'm not going to be talking about these things excessively, just enough to be informative for people who may want to get, get top surgery or maybe getting it soon, um, or for folks who may be caring for someone who's getting top surgery soon or in the future. And also people who are getting mastectomies, actually, because uh, that surgery is really similar. It's almost the same, to be honest. And also a big, 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 big disclaimer that I am not a medical professional. And for legal purposes, I'm required to tell you that all this advice... <laughs> is terrible, and please do not take it. <laughs> you know what, rather than advice, just think of this as me sharing my personal experience. Just sharing it. Ultimately, you've got to talk to your doctor, doctors, and yes, I'm aware there is a huge information gap um, that accessing Appropriate medical care is hard. It's hard to get all the info, even from doctors. And it's hard to think of all the questions that you need to ask. So yes, I am here, hopefully, to help with that. So, what's really wild to me is that it has been three months, um, almost exactly, since I had my top surgery, and, uh, yeah, it's really surreal. I feel, I feel really great, to be honest. It's almost like sometimes I feel good enough, like, it's almost like I didn't have any surgery, but, of course, my scars are still really pink and, uh, pretty fresh. I mean, they're only three months old, but... Yeah, honestly, about a month ago, I was able to lay flat on my chest in bed, and uh, I sometimes like to sleep on my stomach, so that was really, that made me really happy. And I can reach a lot of things. Um, it's still, it still feels weird to reach for something that's too high, but I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, oh my gosh, I don't even know how I'm going to talk about this because there's just so much to talk about. It's like there's so much information, I don't know how I'm going to remember it all. But I have a little, I have some notes here, so hopefully I can stay kind of on track. On track, on track. But first, I will say... I am so happy with my results. So happy. Um, I originally did not want to keep my nipples because that is an option. You can just not keep your nipples. But my doctor was really against that. And so I was like, fine, it's not even that big of a deal. I'll keep my nipples. But I love them, honestly. They're so great. My surgeon did such a great job. And I think I, I think I would have still been happy with no nipples and I would have I could have gotten tattoos if I wanted. Um, but yeah, I love my new nipples and I don't I don't have a lot of sensation in them, but I also don't have numbness and I have like a small amount of sensation which is kind of cool, and I think you hear, you tend to hear varying stories. Like, you hear about people who have 
awful sensation. You hear about people who have absolutely no sensation, so I'm happy to be somewhere in the middle. Um, I did get some questions on Discord about um, that people wanted to hear the answers to. One was, how long was your recovery period? Well, I think in some ways I'm still recovering, but my major recovery period, I would say, was only like two months. I think after two months I was like, kind of, I, I had gotten through the worst of it, so to speak. Um, even though really it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Um, another question is, how do you feel about your body after top surgery? Complicated. I, I have always struggled with my body image, but I will say a huge amount of dysphoria has been alleviated. And... Yeah, it's, it's even more than I thought it would be. Like, I knew I had dysphoria, but this is like, I just, yeah, it, even just the, the moment I woke up from the surgery, I was just like, oh my god, I feel so much better. <laughs> um, oh, so, I also wrote down some things I talked about in part one that I kind of wanted to respond to. Um, just in case you haven't listened to part one, I recorded that before my top surgery and there were things I was wondering about and I wanted to find out the answers to. Um, I'll link part one in the show notes. I think one of the big things I wondered about in part one was, will, will I have dog ears? And how will, like, how will the outer edges of my scars look? Because I am a fat person, I have a lot of back fat. So I was like, how is this going to look? I also wondered what my range of motion would look like. And to answer both those things... No, I did. I do not have dog ears, um, which I'm very, I'm very happy about. It was a little hard to tell at first because there was a lot of swelling. So please, whatever you do, do not worry if, if at first your chest looks very weird and not at all like you wanted it to look, because you're gonna be super swollen just wait till the swelling goes down and it can take a while like honestly I feel like my swelling didn't totally go down until like a month and a half or two months post-op but yeah actually it seems that my back fat and a combination of my side fat and back fat and the way my surgeon kind of made the incision and stitched me up made it so I actually have a had and still have a very good range of motion and I it's because the end kind of like the end of a of the incisions kind of sit right on a piece of fat so it's like how do I explain this? It's just like not, it's not tight. It's very, like there's just a lot of give in that area. And so, yeah, I can reach and even from, even from very soon after surgery, I was able to reach higher than, than I thought. Um, not super high and I didn't push myself, but yeah, I was able to reach pretty high. And I was like, I don't know, I feel bad for thin people because I just wonder if their scars are like much tighter. Like if the end of their scar is 
if there's no fat there. I, I just, I feel like they really won't be able to move. It just, they won't have a very good range of motion at all. Um, which sucks, because I know a lot of, a lot of surgeons make you lose weight before surgery. My surgeon did not, which I really appreciated, and some surgeons will give the completely BS excuse, like, oh, I, it's too hard to operate on fat bodies or whatever, but my surgeon did just fine, so I really don't see, I just don't think it's a good excuse. I don't think it's, uh, yeah, I don't think it's good for surgeons to do that. Um, but yeah, in regard to the swelling, the, my swelling has gone down so much, and, and, uh, my chest no longer looks weird and huge like it did. <laughs> so yeah, don't worry about how it looks at first. Really wait for the swelling to go down, and if, if the swelling goes down and it still looks weird, you can always ask for a revision. Um, another thing, the costs. So, my surgery, even though I have health insurance, cost way more than I thought it would. Um, even though, you know, like, I had talked to my surgeon's office about what it would cost. I had talked to friends who went to the same doctor and, you know, my insurance had basically already decided what the surgery would cost because uh, you need pre-authorization. But honestly, don't even, I don't even blame my, my surgeon's office for not knowing because there's like, not knowing the full extent of the costs, because it's just, there's so many different insurance plans, it's just hard to know that, but I, I do wish they at least would have told me, like, hey, there's gonna be a facility fee, and then there's gonna be an anesthesiologist's fee, because that's essentially what it was. There were three separate fees, the surgeon's fee, the uh, facility fee and the anesthesiologist's fee and they were all pretty pricey even with my insurance and I have I have really decent insurance like it's not it's not anything to sniff at so the cost of everything was disappointing um yeah I would recommend doing as much as much research on that as possible and expecting at least those three categories of fees and if you can ask specifically like hey what what facility am i going to be at what's their phone number call them ask what their facility fee is um the anesthesiologist is a little harder i think because they may not necessarily know which anesthesiologist is going to be at your surgery, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And even, well, here's the thing, even if they, you, they do know which anesthesiologist is going to be at the surgery, they don't know how much, how long the surgery is going to take and how much anesthetic it's going to, it's there, you're going to need. Um, at least I think those things factor in. Honestly, I don't really know, but... Yeah, there was a fee. There were many fees that I just kept getting surprised by. But everything will be okay. It was just... It's just disappointing, and I think for... For lots of people, that can be really scary to just get hit with a sudden fee. Um, but if that does happen to you, definitely ask if they have any, um, financial aid. A lot of places do. Um, ask if they can put you on a payment plan. Uh, there's an office, a doctor's office, a surgery center, whatever they are, they should always be willing to put you on a payment plan. There's really, 
no excuse for not putting you on a payment plan. Oh, I should have mentioned this before, but I live in America. Some of you already knew that, but just to, just to talk about, like, where, where I am located, um, what healthcare system I'm working within, uh, yeah, I live in America. I had my surgery done in Ohio, which is where I live, and, yeah, um, our healthcare system is definitely not the best, but hopefully it can continue to get better. One thing that really confused me before my surgery was the drains. I, I had to, like, specifically look up YouTube videos to understand what the drain was is how it worked um drains are weird at first but you get a hang of them really quickly essentially the drains are kind of poking out of your surgery sites um like they'll be just under your armpit probably and it's really good to have a friend or partner someone who's willing to do your drains for you, at least at first. Um, I, uh, by, by like day six or seven, I could do my own drains, but it was a little awkward. It's, uh, it's easier when you have someone to do it for you and kind of write down the amount of fluid that comes out. And what comes out is essentially blood and other fluid. Um, but the drains are really important because they'll keep you from having uh, a hematoma, which could happen anyway. Um, I was lucky enough to not have a hematoma, but if you do have a hematoma, and your doctor will, should talk to you about this, but, you know, you just call the, call your surgeon back. It's kind of an emergency situation. You go in, they do emergency surgery to get the hematoma out. It's essentially just a buildup of blood. Um, but I didn't have that. I was very lucky. Um, I have a friend who just had top surgery who had a hematoma. And I've had friends who've, who've had hematomas before as well. It's, it seems kind of common. It just didn't, didn't happen with me. Um, So, my friend, who was taking care of me, essentially had to empty my drains twice a day. And you, you empty them into little cups, you measure the blood, you write it down, and then you pour it into the toilet or something. And then you, uh, you close up the drain, you squeeze the air out, and then close it so it acts like a vacuum. Um, something I wish I had known about, you can get these little pouches at your waist, kind of like tool belts to hold your drains, and I really wish I had got one of those because it was kind of awkward at times having the pouch or the drains clipped to my bandages. It was just awkward sometimes. Um, but yeah, the measurements would usually be like... 30 milliliters at first, um, per side, so like 30 milliliters on each side, um, and that would be like the first day, and then by, by the seventh day, I would be putting, outputting like 10 milliliters per side, sometimes less than that. Um, I expected the drains to be messier, but they were really not they they were really just not messy. Uh, there were only two two incidents in which blood ended up spraying on me, but only two, only two times. I honestly expected to have a lot more um, accidents, but nope. Um, stripping the drain, your uh, surgeon's office will probably give you some alcohol wipes, but 
not enough. Like, mine didn't give me enough, so I, I bought extra alcohol wipes. But anyway, stripping the drain is taking the alcohol wipe and starting at the top near your armpit and just dragging the alcohol wipe down and basically getting all the fluid down into the little drain bulb. Um, and it's hard at first, and you feel like you have to be really gentle, but do not be afraid to really, really squeeze those tubes. Um, the alcohol wipes really help because they reduce friction, but also be really careful, or have the person doing it be really careful. Um, you have to grip the top part of the tube because, um, you could easily pull, you could pull it out if you strip the drain too hard and that will that will hurt and also it will probably be too early so keep that in mind you should have your you should have your drains in for like 7 days at least and by the time you get them out you should be only putting out in my opinion you should only be putting out like 10 milliliters per side um, when you get them out. But yeah, I, I really needed the help at first, for sure. And if you're thinking of recovering alone or only having someone for the first 24 hours, just don't. <laughs> um, trust me, I needed the help. I needed someone to do my drains. And even after my post-surgical binder was off, I needed help wrapping my chest and applying the ointment and the nonstick wound pads and maybe, um, yeah, I just needed the help. And also, speaking of all these supplies, um, like extra Actually, not all surgeons use ace wrap, so you may not actually need ace wrap, but feel free to ask your surgeon. But, like, I feel like the ointment, um, like, Aquaphor or Vaseline or, um, Bacitracin, that's the ointment that's, that I had to use. I had to use a lot of Bacitracin, which is, like, Neosporin type stuff, and nonstick wound pads. Those are really important. Um... I mean, at, at the end of the day, ask your surgeon also what you'll need to recover. But I feel like, especially now, like if you're getting your top surgery soon, order this stuff. If you can, order the supplies in advance because you never know how long shipping is going to take nowadays. And it can be, yeah, it can be really difficult sometimes and take a long time. And who knows what the future may bring, right? So, actually getting the surgery. Let me tell you about my experience. I decided to go into the surgery center alone because I didn't want to expose any of my friends or loved ones to risk, even though they said I was allowed to bring one person in. But I was just like... We're in a pandemic. I'm not going to ask someone to come into the surgery center with me. Um, emotionally, yeah, I wish I had someone, but I just didn't want to risk it. Um, so I was alone in the waiting room. And I was pretty nervous. Um, but honestly, it wasn't that bad. It, the nurses were all really nice, and yeah, everyone was just really friendly there, and they put me at ease. And my surgeon is also really nice and friendly. Um, oh yeah, before my surgery, I had to have a COVID test. Like, a couple days before my surgery, I had a COVID test. And then I had to quarantine, like, basically up until the surgery, because... You know, they give you the COVID test. They don't want you to go out and get COVID. Um, they want you to take the test, stay quarantined, get the results. If your results are good, you go in, you have your surgery. Um, oh yeah, one thing that really 
frustrated me is I had to stop taking ibuprofen two weeks before my surgery and I really rely on ibuprofen for pain management so that was really hard um but yeah you basically have to stop taking any type of anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen motrin aspirin there's a whole bunch of other things you have to stop taking but um before your surgery because they make your they make your blood really thin I think is the right way to describe it I'm not 100% sure though um, but you have to stop smoking, um, beforehand. Yeah, I talked a little bit about buying supplies in advance. I'll talk about some more supplies. I'm just reading my notes and I'm not quite there yet. But another thing you probably want to do is start a fundraiser beforehand because you will, like with my surgeon, I had to put a thousand dollars down to even reserve my surgery date. So, a lot of the things you can pay after the fact, but check with your surgeon, like, what do I have to pay up front in order to get this surgery done? Because the rest of it you can just pay on a payment plan if you need to. Um, but, yeah, so, once they took me back from the We'll say we're like, okay, Blue, come on back. Um, they put me in a prep room and put me in a hospital gown. And yes, all your clothes have to come off. And that's because they might put a catheter in you after you're knocked out. Um, which I guess is kind of a good thing. So then you can just pee while you're asleep. Um... And I think they did put a catheter in me, because when I woke up, I found, like, there's, like, this kind of sticky residue um, on your lower belly, and that means they put a catheter in, I think. But I had a team of four or maybe five nurses, I can't remember exactly, and then my surgeon, and then on top of that, an anesthesiologist... Um, I got to meet them, uh, all in the prep room before my surgery. They were all really nice, and they asked about my mask and stuff. Yeah, that was funny. It's like, I'm completely naked in a hospital gown, but I still have on my mask. <laughs> I don't know, it just, it just made me chuckle. Um, but my anesthesiologist was really excited to learn that I had never, never been put under before. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little scared about that, but it was all fine. Like, of course it's normal to be scared, but of course it all worked out fine. So, there was nothing to worry about. Oh yeah, but because nausea is a common side effect coming out of anesthetic, I told them I have... A history of really bad motion sickness, which is true. I have really, really severe motion sickness. I get motion sick so easily and so bad. So I told them this and they're like, okay, we're going to give you extra anti-nausea meds. And thank goodness they did because I only threw up like once when I woke up. And yeah, I don't think I could have handled more than that. But it is very normal to... Um, get sick when you wake up so just be prepared for that and also if you have motion sickness please tell them and they will probably give you extra anti-nausea medicine um a few of the nurses were really nice like extra nice the doctors were great but <laughs> There was one nurse in particular who misgendered me several times and also gave me incorrect information about my drains and said I had to empty the drains every 15 minutes. I was like, I was like, no, that's wrong. Like, I have my surgeon printed me off a paper that literally said, empty your drains in the morning and the night 
And this nurse was like, oh yeah, every 15 minutes. I'm like, what? And also you're misgendering me. And I literally just had top surgery. So that was awkward. Extremely awkward. I was out of it, but my friend who came to pick me up was so mad. They were like, what is happening with this nurse? <laughs> what are you doing? Um... Oh yeah, one thing, um, you probably should think about way beforehand because you will need a notary to notarize this, but you want to think about a last will and testament, um, not because you're going to die, but just because you're having major surgery and honestly, if you can't bring yourself to write a last will and testament, you probably shouldn't be having a surgery, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, just in case, just uh, dot your I's and cross your T's, um, fill out your last will and testament, um, talk to your close friends or loved ones about what you want to happen with your body when you die, and just like, yeah, what you want to happen in the, in the very rare, rare, rare scenario that you, um, are in some kind of coma or, or you can't wake up or whatever. And just, yeah, just be very clear about that and very intentional. And yeah, again, it doesn't mean you're going to die. It's just being careful like, honestly, you probably have more, a higher chance of dying in a car accident than during top surgery. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just even further proof that it's just good to have a last will and testament anyway. Um, anything can happen at any time. It's just important to be prepared, you know, and to have those conversations before it's too late. But, obviously, I did not die. <laughs> a f my friend came and picked me up. And I felt surprisingly lucid. Like, able to walk. And stuff. And, uh, at that time, I did not feel a lot of pain. Like, uh... I think the pain meds were still coursing through me. Because they gave me a lot of pain meds and... And yeah, I'm pretty sure they were still in my system. But I went home, my friends helped set me up in bed, and brought me water and food. And I honestly slept pretty well that first week. Oh, another thing I did was I set up a meal train. Like, I set up a fundraiser, but also a meal train, so I had, um friends bring bring meals for me and my caretakers once per day for the first seven days of my surgery and that was really amazing because if anything will make you reach in high places that you weren't expecting to reach it is cooking uh for sure so n having not having to cook was great that, that was really great. Plus my energy levels. Like, you're just... I just wasn't in a place to cook, you know? We were... And me and my caretakers, we were busy, you know, emptying my drains and stuff. We didn't have time to cook. Um, but yeah, it was nice to... People people want to help your friends want to help and and it's a nice way to let people help you know let them cook for you not everyone is able to donate money or wants to donate money but some people are more than happy to cook for you and yeah i had some friends bring us just like a ton of food we were able to freeze it and i was eating that that food like for the next month. <laughs> Not really, but almost. Um, but yeah, I slept pretty well that first week. Um, well, I guess I slept okay. I was taking pain meds regularly, um, 
not a lot, just enough. Just enough to sleep, you know, and just to be comfortable. Um, but the pain, the pain was not very severe that first, the first couple weeks, I'll say. It just was, yeah, it just was not very severe. Um, my, my post-surgical binder, um, all post-surgical binders seem to be different from what I've seen. Um, my post-surgical binder was just big foam squares placed like kind of wound pads over my chest. Um, but they were stuck there with like wound glue. I'm not exactly sure what it was. Um... And then all that was wrapped up with ace bandages. So that was my post-surgical binder. And honestly, it was really uncomfortable. It kept me in a hunched position, but I was extremely determined to stay in that position for the entire week. And I did. <laughs> but, oh my god, when I got out of that thing, oh, that was a beautiful day. So, I've already talked a little bit about my range of motion and why my theory as to why my range of motion was so good. It was just the location of my incisions on my side fat. Um, some, some doctors talk about n you shouldn't lift your arms higher than your shoulder for six months. And... I'm really glad that was not me, but sadly, I can see that happening with some people. It's just all going to depend on how your surgeon cuts you up, essentially, and where your incisions are. Um, ideally, the ends of your incisions will be on a little pocket of fat or something, and... I'm sorry, thin people. I think you're going to have worse range of motion. That's just my personal theory um, about why my range of motion was good or better than other people's. Um, but I should talk about my fibromyalgia and my autoimmune hypothyroidism because I think both uh, made my situation a little unique. Um, I don't think there's any official studies on, like, how people with fibromyalgia do with top surgery or double mastectomy, um, or how people with autoimmune hypothyroidism do. Um, I will say my sleep was really affected, um, and that's just something that happens when I'm having bad pain. My sleep cycle gets worse and I'm not able to sleep. So melatonin is your friend or <laughs> anything that helps helps you sleep, to be honest. Um, in some states, cannabis or medical cannabis is legal. And if that works for you, absolutely, definitely use that. Um, especially if it helps you sleep. But yeah, even... I, I thought that after after the one month mark, my pain would get better. But honestly, my I was in a lot of pain for the first two months. It was just very bad, very 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 bad. And uh, yeah, pain meds it was honestly the only thing that got me through. Um, I just took my medications. Uh, and, yeah, just tried, tried everything just to sleep, because sleep is so important, but I could not, I could not get it when I was in pain. Okay, so I've already talked about the meal train and how, um, I'm really glad I didn't have to cook because... You know, when you're cooking, you're probably reaching up onto top shelves, even if they're not super high. You still won't have that range of motion, especially at first. 
Um, another thing is cleaning. Even the act of scrubbing back and forth can stretch your scars. So just be really careful if you're gonna um, clean. Uh, make sure you're wearing like steri strips or silicon strips, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about those in a little bit. But or just just don't clean. Just ask people to help you clean until you're more able to clean. Like I feel like it's been it's been three months, and I I honestly can I feel like I can clean stuff on my own now. But definitely the first two months, I would not recommend scrubbing anything. Like, basic cleaning is fine, but, like, scrubbing vigorously and, like, bending over and reaching and all that stuff is just... That's too much. That's gonna stretch your scars. And, yeah, so cleaning. Please have someone help you. Random stuff you don't think about, like reaching ceiling fans, you can't, like I couldn't reach the pull cord to turn the lights and the fan, um, so think about just random stuff like that, like you'll either need to get on a stool or you need to ask for help with ceiling fans and other stuff that's high up. Um, I went back to work three weeks post-op, and I immediately had to call off the second, my second day back, and then the fourth day also, because my body was just like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> but it was, honestly, it was due to the pain and therefore the lack of sleep. So, looking back, I would... I wish I would have talked to my doctor more, um, to just extend my leave, my medical leave, because that would have totally been possible. I was just like, I feel great, I can go back to work, and then ending up just having to call off was like, uh, it was just so annoying. Um, but yeah, don't push yourself. I know, I, I know it's a... I definitely am privileged to be able to go on medical leave and to be able to call off and not fear getting fired. Um, but please do factor factor your medical leave into your fundraiser and and don't don't push yourself. It's really important. And speaking of pain, um some of the pain medicine they prescribe you, if they're prescribing you any kind of oxycodone type medication, and your doctor should tell you this, but that medicine will constipate you like you have never been constipated before. So stock up on laxatives because your doctor will not give you laxatives. You have to buy those before, before your surgery. Um, but I actually had three different laxatives. One of them was Miralax, the powder. Um, and the others were pills. And I'm just going to remind you, do not take my advice. For legal reasons, I must tell you my advice is terrible. <laughs> but in my experience, I had to take way more laxative than I thought I needed um, just to have normal poop. So keep that in mind because being constipated really sucks. Like a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, silicon strips. So silicon strips are something you can stick on top of your, um, on top of your scars uh, to keep them from stretching and my doctor said I was able to start using them right away but please ask your doctor because I don't know if that 
applies to everyone, but my doctor, like, I just got my post-surgical binder off and my doctor was like, yeah, it's fine to start using silicon strips, so I did. Um, and I tried, I tried a bunch of different brands and to be honest, I don't really, I really don't like any of the brands. Um, they all are not as good as they claim to be and they have this problem where if they're like under your arm they kind of start to peel away and then they get fuzzy and the glue gets bad well it's not really glue it's just like a gel sticky thing um and if you start to sweat under them it just feels really gross um that said, when I'm wearing them, I do feel, like, really safe and secure. Like, I feel like, I feel like my scars are protected and that I'm able to reach without stretching my scars or hurting anything. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll post some of the brands I tried in, in the, or the kinds I tried in the show notes. Um... I guess I do like one brand slightly more than the other brand. Um, another another option is Steri Strips. Um, I like Steri Strips. I think they're more supposed to be temporary because they kind of just go um, perpendicular. Is that the word? You just take little like inch long sections of steri strip and put them over the over the over your scars at different points um but i did notice those uh irritated my skin and i i left i left one on for like two days and then when i pulled it off i had like a literal wound where the steri strip had been i think it was some kind of allergic reaction Oh yeah, and the bio oil, the, there's this popular, um, scar, like you're supposed to massage your scars, and really you can just use Vaseline or Aquaphor, um, those are both really good options, but some people use bio oil, and it's just mineral oil with a bunch of fragrances added, so looking back I wish I had just got mineral oil, cause the bio oil, uh, all the fragrances, uh, irritated my, irritated my sensitive skin. It does smell really good, but it made me break out in a rash, so that was kind of sad, because the bio oil was a little bit expensive. Oh yeah, another thing my doctor gave me, or the hospital gave me, I, can't, I don't know if it was my surgeon, or if it was the surgery center that sent me home with this ice pack that is specifically made for people who've just gotten mastectomies or top surgery and it's just like an ice pack for your chest a huge ice pack that you velcro to your chest and you just wear it to keep the swelling down and oh my god it felt so amazing like on on days where i was in a lot of pain in my chest um yeah just slap that ice pack on and Oh, beautiful, beautiful relief. Oh, let's see. Oh yeah, getting the post-surgical binder off. It was, it was, um, easy. It was nice getting, so I went to my first post-surgical appointment on the eighth day, I think, after my surgery. Or maybe it was the ninth day, but... I went back to my surgeon's office and um, got the drains taken out, which hurt a little bit. It was honestly not that bad, even though one got stuck and they had to like really pull to get it out. That was probably the most painful thing, but it was over so quickly. It was just like not even, it was not even a thing really. Um... Getting the post-surgical binder off did not hurt me, but I can see it hurting someone if you have chest hair. 
Um, but I noticed, I noticed my surgeon or someone shaved off my chest hair during surgery and actually shaved my underarm hair too. Um, just anything in that general area where they were doing surgery got shaved. And I don't even have very much chest hair. I just have like peach fuzz, but they still shaved it. So yeah, if you wake up and a bunch of hair is shaved, don't be surprised. <laughs> it's just one of the many things that happens. But yeah, that was that was a nice appointment. It was it was kind of relaxing to be honest, getting the post surgical binder taken off and they put on all the ointments and put on the the wound pads and wrapped me up in the ace wrap and it was all good. All good. But please do remember that every surgeon does this procedure differently. Um, every surgeon recommends different things before and after surgery. And also every body is different. So, you know, I've, I've told you my experience and my whole story. Um, but take it all, take it all with a grain of salt because it could be totally, totally different for you. Um, but at the same time, I hope I have helped you just by telling you my experience. Um, I hope something can be useful because, you know, sometimes nurses tell you the wrong information about your drains and, <laughs> and it's, it's good to be able to just be like, no, you're pretty sure you're wrong. <laughs> good to be a little informed. <laughs> so I know I've already said this, but I just want to reaffirm that I love my results so much. I love my scars. I love the shape of my chest. Um, I love my nipples. I just love, I love having a flat chest. Um, yeah, it's weird how natural it feels. Like, I, I just don't even, I mean, I think about it, but I, like, don't think about it, which is amazing to not have to think about my chest. It's like, I didn't realize how much it was, how much I was preoccupied with it, and yeah, just how much dysphoria I had. And yeah, it's just like this body feels like my body. It feels like I've always had this body, even though I definitely have not. But yeah, I absolutely do not regret the surgery. Um, I feel affirmed in my non-binary gender. I... Oh gosh, it's just like a whole, a whole new world has opened up to me, and I feel like I'm rethinking, like, how, how am I gonna live my life now in this new body? I'm learning new things about myself every day, I'm re, re-examining, um, different potential ways I want to express myself. Yeah, I'm just doing a lot of exploration now that I've had this super necessary surgery and I just feel amazing. I'm so happy. I'm so grateful. I'm so glad it's over and done with. <laughs> I mean, it, it in some ways it feels like it took a very long time, but now that you know, now that I'm three months post-op, I'm like, oh my gosh, it, that, it all went by so quickly. <laughs> Before I end this episode, I just want to talk a little more about scar massage. And yeah, I'm pretty sure my doctor said I could start scar massage, um, 
pretty much immediately after I got my post-surgical binder off, but just, um, to be kind of gentle. Um, honestly though, I, I wasn't always super gentle. Um, and sometimes when you're massaging, or at least when I was massaging, I would hear, like, <laughs> these really loud snaps. And it didn't hurt. I would just hear something snap inside my chest as I was massaging the scars. And I, even now, I don't fully know if it was a stitch, like an internal stitch snapping, or if it was scar tissue snapping, or possibly both. Um, that is to say... Uh, don't be alarmed. It's normal, apparently. Um, I asked some friends and they said, yeah, that happened to me. It's normal. I was like, okay, if you say so. But yeah, scar massage is really important. And honestly, it feels really good. Um, I needed help with the scar massage at first, but eventually I was able to, like, reach my left side with my right hand and reach my right side with my left hand and those are the those are the hardest parts to reach when you're massaging but yeah scar massage is really important and it will feel it should feel pretty good and i think i I have not stopped doing scar massage. I, I do it pretty regularly, even now, but I don't think, I don't think I have to be doing it. I think it's only necessary, like, the first month or two months. Ask your doctor, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it's technically necessary anymore. I'm just doing it because it feels good and to keep my, to keep my, uh, scars protected because they're still pretty fresh, pretty raw, pretty pink because that's the color that my scars uh, turn. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I hope, I hope you found this interesting or helpful and if you have any questions, please feel free to um, email me or DM me or Instagram message me, you know, whatever. I have, a, there's a lot of different ways to reach me and yeah, I would be happy to answer your questions if I can. Oh, one last thing, so... Of course, this is not a reading reviews episode, but I did notice there was one review that came in, um, where someone talked about, um, they said they love my top surgery journal episode, and that they're thinking of getting top surgery one day, and they are having a lot of dysphoria about their chest, and they've been using a headband to bind it, so... I definitely understand the desire to alleviate dysphoria, but um, I really recommend only using like an actual binder to bind your chest because binding can be dangerous um, if not done properly. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's your body. You know what's best for you. Like, if your dysphoria is really bad, I would much rather you bind with a headband than, you know, just any number of horrible alternatives. Um, but, but if 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 you can, if there's any way, um, you can bind with a binder, um, like from. Underworks or from GC2B, um, those are two really good companies. Uh, please, 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 please do. Um, the most dangerous thing about binding, 
I think, is how fluid can build up in your lungs. And yeah, especially during COVID, it just makes it even more dangerous if you were to get COVID or some other type of respiratory infection and your lungs were already compromised because of um, improper binding. That could be, that, that would be really bad and I would be, I would be really heartbroken if that happened to anyone, you know, especially a listener. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that, and I know not everyone has the ability to buy a binder. Um, so I don't know. I've been thinking about doing a binder giveaway for a while now. Maybe that's something... Maybe that's something I'll do coming up in the future. Definitely let me know um, in, you know, a, in a review or email me, DM me. Let me know if that's something you would like um, or that would be helpful to you. Because I think everyone, everyone deserves to live without dysphoria in a safe, in, in a way that's as safe as possible. But yeah, this has been Top Surgery Diaries, part two, episode two of the Top Surgery Diaries series. I'm honestly not sure if there's going to be a part three, but there might be. I mean, I still, I still have a lot. This journey is far from over. <laughs> far from over. But yeah, not sure at the moment if there will be a part three, but please do send me any anything I missed, anything I forgot to talk about, any questions you have, just uh, message me, leave it in a review, email me, DM me. I have all sorts of ways to contact me and uh, trust me, I will not, I will not be annoyed, I will not be bothered. Oh yeah, you can join the Discord and ask me there. That's uh that would also be fine if you if you have Discord, if you like Discord. But thank you so much for listening. I hope this has been helpful or informative or enjoyable or all three or something else positive. And I'm wishing you uh listener all the good feelings, all the safety, all the relief from that dysphoria that you try to escape every day. You deserve all the best care and all the best things, all the happiness in the world. And you are, you are you. You are valid. Your identity is valid and you deserve to be respected. You deserve to have your pronouns respected and your name respected. Yeah, you deserve to be respected and loved. And if no one has told you recently, I love you. I'm sending you a big cartload of love. <laughs> so please know that. And I'll catch you in the next episode. This is Blue Skies signing off for the next.